now we're going to discuss electron uh, isospin or the spin of electrons, spin up, spin down, exchange symmetry, and the Pauli exclusion principle, the quantum mechanical version of that Pauli exclusion principle. So we often think about, uh, up to this point, we've been thinking about electron spin as having certain effects. Uh, that one effect is that uh, the sort of two electrons per orbital rule or two electrons per sort of uh, uh, state uh, rule. You have one spin up electron, one spin down electron. Uh, so you can put, say, two electrons in 1s, you know, two electrons in 2s. Uh, there are three different 2p orbitals, so then that gives you six electrons, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, that's one effect. And then the other effect, of course, is this uh, Zeeman effect that we discussed, the uh, splitting of various energy levels due to the presence of a magnetic field. Um, however, there are some other effects uh, that are uh, really kind of quantum in nature. We're going to have to represent them in wave functions. Uh, there's, there's really not a classical analog. And these effects uh, really primarily arise from some of the strange uh, properties that identical particles have uh, according to uh, quantum theory. And uh, there's some properties that wave functions have to have. So uh, before we go into this, uh, this property uh, called exchange symmetry, we need to introduce a new uh, shorthand uh, because uh, our notation is getting a bit kind of crowded and uh, had, has a lot of uh, details in it, and uh, so uh, we'll, we'll introduce a new sort of simplified shorthand that should look somewhat familiar in that uh, if we have, say, a two-electron wave function, psi, uh, for, say, helium uh, in the ground state, so we so far we've represented that as uh, psi for the system, say, uh, is equal to a product of this uh, 1s wave function uh, for coordinates r1, where r1 is a, a vector. So we're, what, we're, what I'm saying is uh, x1, y1, and z1. So, it, so one electron has its set of coordinates, and then another electron uh, has its own set of coordinates. Uh, and uh, they're independent, and so we need to give them labels. Uh, so we call it R1 and R2. Uh, and we also can think of them as, you know, electron uh, corresponding to electron 1 and electron 2. So that's kind of like a label telling you which electron is which. Uh, although in, in this case, they're, the functional forms of the wave functions are identical, but, you know, just with different coordinates. Uh, so we're going to replace that uh, or, or, or introduce another uh, shorthand. Uh, we can always go back and forth uh, if needed, uh, but uh, we can replace this psi 1s parentheses vector r1 with just this label 1s parentheses 1 and parentheses. So 1s parentheses 1. Uh, and for the second electron, we'll call that 1s2 where again we use these uh, parentheses. And uh, these are, uh, these are our uh, electron labels, and they help us keep track of things. Now in this case, uh, the difference, uh, the labels don't seem all that important, but you can imagine other electronic configurations where uh, you have uh, 
uh, two electrons and they're in different electronic states. Uh, so, and, and of course we'll, we'll talk about those examples later. Now this is only part of the picture. Of course, uh, what we've been sort of neglecting in our wave functions and in our uh, variational approach to helium up to this point has been spin. We haven't really, uh, uh, we, we brought up spin briefly, uh, then used it, uh, uh, used spin wave functions a little bit to talk about the Zeeman effect. Uh, now we're going to introduce, uh, reintroduce them again, these alpha and beta spin wave functions. Uh, so if we have, you know, if we have this kind of uh, diagram where we've got, say, a, a 1s state, and we have one electron that's spin up and the other one is spin down, uh, then we could represent that uh, in this way. We keep the the electronic parts, the spatial parts of the wave functions together. Sorry, yeah, the spatial parts together. So we'll say 1s parentheses 1, uh, 1s parentheses 2, alpha 1, beta 2. And so that would mean that the first electron is in the 1s orbital uh, and it's uh, spin up. And the second electron is also in a 1s orbital, uh, and it's spin down. So there's this nice, neat uh, correspondence between our, our energy level diagram showing occupancy that I had to the right here, uh, and the wave function. Um, and, uh, but there are some things we can do with the wave function that we, that we can't that are difficult to represent using uh, that occupancy uh, diagram. Uh, so, but there's a. It turns out that there's a problem. Uh, so this is um, this is an attempt. Uh, but it's is incorrect. Uh, which is a little bit uh, disconcerting perhaps to hear at this point because uh, it looks very much like it, it, there, it looks like it agrees very neatly with our typical energy level diagrams with the up arrow and down arrows representing spin up electrons and spin down electrons. However, uh, the, the problem is that uh, that there's a rule imposed by quantum mechanics, which is that um, uh, which is that uh, electrons are identical particles, and wave functions cannot or are not allowed to distinguish between identical particles. So in this uh, this attempted wave function uh, commits the error of saying that one of the that the first electron is spin up and the second electron is spin down. The properly expressed wave function uh, can't do that, and this isn't just an accounting issue. It turns out it really has some important effects on this, uh, this identical particles rule uh, has some uh, important effects uh, with respect to what electronic configurations are allowed uh, and things like how many different states there are, uh, or in other words, the degeneracy of a particular electronic configuration uh, and and of course, that's going to affect its properties, uh, things like the energy of the system, the thermodynamic properties, 
and so on. And and uh, so uh, and and what else? And the also yeah the relative yeah the relative energy levels of those um, states. Uh, so it's uh, it ends up being uh, important. Uh, and and it's going to it's going to introduce some complexity, but at, uh, but there's it's it, it's not just uh, an accounting an accounting issue. It also helps make more accurate predictions. Um, so uh, we need a way to ensure that we have valid wave functions. Uh, and so basically what we need to do is uh, we need to find a way to take our, our wave function um, and then exchange labels and then that's going to give us you know a, a different wave function and then we're going to uh, compare. And uh, if we exchange our labels and we get back the wave function that we that we started with, uh, maybe with a sign change, uh, then um, If they're identical after this exchange, in other words, if the unexchanged and the exchanged wave function are identical, then a then our wave function is is maybe okay. Or valid. Although there's another wrinkle which I'll introduce uh, momentarily. So one way to handle this is uh, we can just say, well, we'll just exchange labels and see what happens. Uh, I like to do it in terms of an operator. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit more formal, uh, but it, it's, it makes it a little bit easier to keep track of, of what's going on. So we're going to introduce an exchange operator. And I'm going to use kind of a capital X I J uh, to, uh, with a with a hat on it. That's my exchange operator, and this swaps labels I and J. So uh, so for instance, if we had x1, 2, then what that's going to do is any place in our wave function where we have uh, parentheses 1, that's going to be replaced with parentheses 2. And similarly, uh, any instance of 2 gets replaced with 1. And so uh, what we can do is we can act our exchange operator on our wave function uh, and then compare the resulting wave function to the wave function that we started off with. Uh, if, if we get essentially the same wave function, uh, then, or, or the same wave function with some allowed rearrangements, uh, which I'll try to clarify momentarily, uh, then Uh, it, if um, if we act our wave uh, exchange operator on a wave function and we get back the same wave function, and again I'll talk about the rules of that, um, then then uh, psi does not distinguish. And there's another. rule 
uh, regarding the sign, uh, which I'll talk about momentary, uh, in a bit. Okay, and uh, j just one thing I want to quickly interject. You might think, well, if, if the best way to make sure we don't uh, distinguish being between electrons is to just not label them. But that's that's not really true. It's, it turns out that some ways of representing the, the wave function of the system implicitly uh, distinguish between the electrons. And that's that's really what we're trying to, to do is, is sort of uh, d don't hide any sort of implicit um, treating of the particles as non-identical. Uh, so we have to, you know, have explicit labels, and then we have to watch carefully what happens when we exchange those, when we swap labels, and uh, and then that's going to give us a, a robust uh, way of. of checking our wave functions and sort of uh, we don't want to just sort of go on a, a promise to not uh, distinguish between elect uh, between wave functions we need to actually test it okay so uh, for for any sort of labeling bias uh, so so essentially one way to look at this is if if the the wave function is an eigenfunction of this exchange operator. So we're familiar with this concept of an eigenfunction. Uh, then, then the wave function doesn't distinguish between labels. They're distinguished between electrons. Okay, so uh, I'm going to simplify just a little bit more for a bit uh, because uh, let's just look at the the spin part of our helium wave function. So our, again, I'm saying this is our invalid wave function that we sort of started with. This was our initial guess, alpha one, beta two. If we act our exchange operator that's going to give us alpha 2 beta 1 now we can rearrange a little bit but the labels are sticky they they stick to the uh, you know unless we're actually applying the the exchange operator you know which will of course cause the labels to to swap um, we, we can do some algebraic rearrangements of our system, but the alpha is always going to be associated with the label to its right. Uh, so they're, you know, labels are sticky. Uh, they're always going to be the, each label is going to be associated with the wave function to its left. Uh, you know, unless of course we're applying this exchange operator, but then that's you know, then that will of course swap the labels. But anyway, so if we apply this this exchange operator on a wave function, yeah, we can we can rewrite the wave function as beta one, alpha two. We can swap them that way, right? Um, that doesn't violate our sticky label rule, um, but yet yeah, neither of these is the wave function that we started off with. So, this, therefore, this is an invalid wave function. Because it distinguishes between the two electrons. So, uh, let's see if we can construct a wave function that does not uh, distinguish between these labels. And 
uh, one of the tricks that we've used previously is to employ a linear combination. And so let's see if that works. Uh, our, our attempt here is going to be, um, we'll use say one over square root of two, alpha one, beta two, plus alpha two, beta one. Okay, then if we uh, act, act our exchange operator, then that's going to give us, uh, of course, the still have our 1 over square root of 2, uh, and then the alpha 1 becomes alpha 2, beta 2 becomes beta 1, plus uh, alpha 1, beta 2. And of course, we can, re we can rearrange without violating our sticky labels rule to get back, All right, we just, uh, move these term this term to the to the front and this one to the back and again that's not going to violate any sort of sticky label rule and that's going to give us alpha 1 beta 2 plus alpha 2 beta 1 and that's what we started with Uh, therefore, um, psi does not distinguish between electrons, which is good. Okay, uh, but let's, uh, before we go too much further, we know that often when we generate a linear combination, there's a there's a linear combination where the signs of the two terms are the same, and there's a linear combination where they're different, where, right, where we have opposite signs. Um, oh, and before I say that, yeah, I'd also like to say um, the uh, the eigenval eigenvalue of the exchange operator. Uh, is 1 in this case. All right, we get back to this, the wave function with its same with the same sign. Okay. Now let's uh, look at the case where we have So yeah, we're going to go back and call this case 1. And let's look at this other case where, again, it's a linear combination, but we have a sign difference between the first uh, terms and the second. Okay, then if we act our exchange operator, That's going to give us alpha 2, beta 1, minus alpha 1, beta 2. Uh, and that is equal to minus the wave function that we started off with, right? Because uh, this, this term here looks like this term here, but there's a sign difference. Uh, and so if we factor out that sign difference, we get a minus, right? And similarly for the for this term, there's there's a sign difference here and a sign difference there. Uh, so we get back uh, the minus the wave function that we started with. So um, the eigenvalue of the exchange operator is minus 1.
Okay, so uh, then the question is, uh, which is correct? Or are they both correct? Uh, so this is where uh, quantum comes in and some quantum exchange rules uh, and uh, oh one thing before I talk about which is correct uh, we, we would say that this um, this wave function is anti-symmetric not non-symmetric, but anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of those two electron labels. Okay, and then th this uh, brings us to Uh, the Pauli exclusion principle uh, quantum mechanics version which is that our total electron wave functions of electrons and other particles that we'll call fermions must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of any two electron labels. And in other words, uh, in terms of operators, and generalizing to more than two electrons, if we if we had a three or six or 11 electron system, if we exchange any two electrons uh, in that system, we, we should get back the same wave function, but with the sign changed. Okay, and uh, this is a, we can think of as a, a, a sort of postulate or rule of quantum mechanics. Uh, we can also think of it as, on some level, as being derived from uh, some higher level, uh, sort of high energy, high energy physics uh, type theory, uh, and just kind of carrying it on down to the uh, to the more modest requirements of quantum mechanics as it applies to molecules. Uh, so this looks rather different than the Pauli exclusion principle that you've seen before. Uh, and it turns out, though, that they're, it, it's somewhat compatible with what you've learned before. Uh, it adds some additional uh, information. It adds some, uh, makes some actually better predictions. Uh, so there's some predictions that you'll get wrong uh, regarding the relative energies of various electronic configurations. Uh, 
uh, if we uh, don't uh, take into account this Pauli exclusion principle, the quantum mechanical version. So definitely quantum chemical calculations you know, on a computer and that sort of thing have to take into account this kind of, of uh, Pauli exclusion principle. So this is what's is one of the things that's happening under the hood in you know Gaussian or uh, or games or any of these quantum chemical software packages. Um, so so this isn't just a, a this has real effects on 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 systems. Not just sort of a, not just sort of an accounting issue. Things like elect electronic configurations. What kinds of electronic configurations are allowed? Um, relative energy of different electronic configurations, as we'll see. Uh, and uh, particularly, we'll see this in excited states. Uh, there's some really important issues regarding electronic excited states. Uh, and and it, it also um, gives rise to some of Hund's rules. So we can think of the uh, Hund's rules Regarding electronic configurations, how you populate energy levels and uh, or how you how you populate the put multiple electrons in the various orbitals and that sort of thing, um, uh, uh, Hund's rules, particularly the the so-called bus seat rule, uh, that's part of Hund's rules. Uh, that uh, uh, and then again that regards that that's related to the relative energy levels of different electronic configurations. Uh, and uh, that uh, th this exchange uh, principle affects that. Um, okay, so let's let's go back to our our full helium wave function. Our ground state helium at lowest energy state is going to be 1s1, 1s2 times, so that's the spatial part, and then the uh, spin part is 1 over square root of 2 uh, alpha 1 beta 2 minus alpha 2, beta 1. So you notice that this, this does not look quite like uh, this diagram, right, where we put the harpoons into 1s, right? Uh, the, but this is uh, more correct in that this is not stating that, you know, oh, well, the electron on the left is in the up state and the electron on the right is in the spin down state. It, it, it's really a, a linear combination. It's kind of a, you know, a dual wave state. You know, both electrons are sort of uh, spin up and spin down at the same time. Um, now, I brought up fermions, uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, fermions and, uh, and bosons.
Well, one thing I'd like to say about that, sorry, back to this. Uh, so this isn't, it's not quite correct, but is it's our starting point. for making a proper wave function. In other words, we'll need to have a wave function that has, uh, if this has spin up and spin down, then we'll need to have uh, alphas and betas in our wave function. Uh, and, um, and of course it'll tell us which electronic states are involved, 1s1, 1s2, if we were. So, so we always start with one of these diagrams, but then we have to take an extra step to make a proper wave function, uh, you know, and then we can use that wave function to uh, simulate experiments, to calculate energy levels, and that sort of thing. But we, you know, and we don't, we can't make predictions until we have a proper wave function. Okay, so back to fermions and bosons. Uh, so, so it turns out that fermions Uh, the wave function must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange of any two labels. And for bosons, oh, and fermions always have half integer spin. Okay, and we can just take these as experimental facts uh, or as postulates of quantum mechanics, at, at least for this level of quantum mechanics, uh, but it also the concept of fermions can be derived from higher energy physics uh, theory, you know, particle physics. You know, the, the standard model and all that. Uh, and uh, for bosons, uh, the wave function must be symmetric with respect to exchange of any two labels. And uh, these have uh, integer or zero spin. Uh, non-half non integer spin. And of course then, then matter is broken down into sort of what are uh, elementary fermions, uh, composite fermions, uh, and elementary bosons and composite uh, bosons. So uh, elementary fermions and again, just, just a little detour into high energy physics here. Uh, these would be um, uh, uh, leptons, uh, which include electron, uh, the electron neutrino, uh, the uh, muon and the antiparticles such as uh, positron um, and uh, you know anti muon and that sort of thing okay and then uh, also uh, another one is quarks those have um, half integer uh, spin. 
Uh, and uh, there are several flavors of quark, you know, up, down, top, bottom, charm, and strange. Uh, we're not going to worry about those. And then, of course, those have there are antiparticles associated with those uh, quarks. Uh, and uh, there are Uh, there are composite fermions, so if you have multiple fermions and uh, and the, the net spin is half integer, then you have a composite fermion. So it turns out, say, a proton uh, has uh, uh, three quarks. And uh, it has a net uh, half integer spin, uh, and uh, then and some nuclei are fermions and some are not. Uh, oh, and so the proton is is a composite fermion, a neutron. Um, now, for 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 chemists, I, I think we're often accustomed to thinking of. Uh, protons and neutrons as, as fundamental particles, uh, the high energy physicists would say no. Um, you know, they're, they, they're made up of quarks. But in any case, they're, they're, those are fermions. Uh, now, sometimes if you, if you end up with a, uh, if you end up with an integer number of protons plus neutrons, uh, then you end up with a composite boson but if you end up with a non-integer, or sorry, if you, sorry, if you end up with an even number of protons and neutrons, uh, then you end up with a composite boson. If you end up with an odd number of protons and neutrons added together, uh, then you end up with a composite fermion. So things like C13 uh, would be a composite fermion. Um, and bosons uh, have, again, different exchange characteristics, uh, and the elementary ones are are uh, photons. The uh, I believe it's called W particle, the Z particle. Um, the uh, glue, what are called gluons, they are supposedly what holds uh, quarks together. Uh, my knowledge of high energy physics is somewhat uh, superficial, so I, I don't know a lot of the details about that. Um, but their gluons mediate the strong force, uh, I believe. And uh, uh, but again, uh, don't consider me an authority on that. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the Higgs uh, boson, uh, which uh, is involved in particles having uh, mass. And then there are uh, composite bosons. Um, and such as uh, things like, oh, Helium-4, uh, carbon-12, uh, those are going to have, those are going to be composite bosons uh, because they have a, an even number of, uh, they, they comprise an even number of fermions and so the, the spin ends up being, the net spin ends up being integer. Uh, and uh, why nature is divided up into these two classes of particles uh, that have different exchange properties. Again, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this course. Um, but uh, one, one important difference between uh, bosons and fermions is that, uh, is that elementary bosons carry force. Um, and so, so gluons mediate the 
uh, the strong force um, photons, uh, of course, uh, since they we can think of them as tied up with the electromagnetic field, uh, you would not be. Uh, it's perhaps not surprising then that photons, uh, you know, mediate uh, 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 electrical interactions, uh, say like Coulomb attraction between charged particles. And uh, so uh, that's one of the properties of bosons. Okay, and uh, so that's our introduction to this concept of, uh, of isospin and electron exchange. And in our uh, next lecture uh, video, we'll discuss something called the Slater determinant. Uh, which is a nice kind of automatic way of generating wave functions that have the proper exchange symmetry. Uh, so, so far we kind of came up with some by trial and error, um, and uh, we will develop a more, uh, something more like, an, more like an algorithm or formula that's going to always give us uh, wave functions that have the right exchange symmetry.